Good morning. Today's hearing of the Congressional Executive Commission on China on protection from persecution, establishing humanitarian pathways for Hong Kongers and Uyghurs has come to order. For years, this commission has documented the Chinese government's repression of its people. Even as that repression continues, the Chinese government continues to seek the repatriation of those searching for protection abroad. China has sought the forcible return of Uyghurs and Kazakhs from Kazakhstan and Thailand. At one point earlier in the COVID-19 pandemic, it appeared to be withholding vaccines from the Turkish government in an attempt to pressure Turkey to ratify an extradition treaty that would put Uyghurs in Turkey at risk of deportation. In Hong Kong, those seeking refuge abroad face arrests and exit bans. This hearing will examine these threats to seeking protection from persecution inside and outside China and shed light on the humanitarian pathways available to those fleeing this persecution. As the Chinese government continues its genocide of Uyghurs and other predominantly Muslim ethnic minorities in Xinjiang and continues to trample the political rights and autonomy promised the people of Hong Kong, the situation is bleak. In fact, our commission's political prisoner database now includes prisoners who are detained in Hong Kong, which the commission previously has not done. Hong Kong prisoners, including those subject to prolonged pretrial detention and those serving lengthy sentences for peacefully exercising their rights. This commission will remain steadfast in our fight to shine a bright light on these abuses, as well as the broader human rights and rule of law situation in China and the Chinese Communist Party's attempts to export repressive models of governance and stifle free expression globally. Members of Congress will continue to work with the administration and like-minded partners across the globe to push for change in the behavior of the Chinese government and Communist Party. But we can't stop there. In the face of egregious violations of internationally recognized human rights, we need to take concrete steps to protect those harmed by authoritarian governments. While we cannot control the Chinese government's behavior, we have the power to protect the persecuted who come to our shores. That's what this hearing is about, taking responsibility for actions within our control to advance humane policies to support Uyghurs, the people of Hong Kong, and others seeking protection as refugees, as asylum seekers, or as beneficiaries of humanitarian parole. In this hearing, we will hear from four witnesses who will help us better understand humanitarian pathways that could be promoted by legislative, executive, or diplomatic action. One of our fellow commissioners will share perspectives on important legislation he is advancing, one of several bills we will hear about today that take actionable, concrete steps to protect the persecuted. We'll also hear from a leading refugee policy expert on potential promise offered by designating Uyghurs and Hong Kongers as priority two refugees, as groups of special humanitarian concern. And we will hear the personal testimonies of two brave exiles now seeking asylum in the United States. Their stories remind us yet again of not only the human costs of repression, but that the victims of that repression look to the United States for help. When we can offer that help, I feel we must. I look forward to today's testimony informing the work of Congress, the administration, and the international community to do just that. I'd now like to recognize my co-chairman, Congressman McGovern, for his opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for convening this timely hearing on creating humanitarian pathways for people fleeing persecution in Hong Kong uh, and the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. For 20 years, uh, this commission has documented the status of human rights in China, allowing us to see, <coughs> allowing us to see trends across the years. Uh, there is no doubt that things have gotten worse under, the, under, the, um, under leader uh, Xi Jinping. And the scale of change uh, is seen most dramatically and tragically in the two areas we are looking at today, Hong Kong 
and the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. I need not spend time reciting these abuses, which we have documented and will be sadly familiar to those who are watching. We appreciate that today's witnesses will testify to their own personal experiences living in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, the suffering they endured, the roads they took to exile, and the hopes they have on how we can provide a humanitarian pathway to others. In the policy realm, Congress and the executive branch have responded to China's repression with multiple actions. This includes new laws to sanction Chinese officials who are complicit in human rights abuses and to prohibit the export of crowd control equipment to security forces. Two administrations have made a genocide determination on the Uyghurs and found that Hong Kong is no longer sufficiently autonomous. They have blocked imports of cotton and, and tomatoes from Xinjiang based on forced labor, and we in Congress look to pass the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. All of these are worthy even as uh, most are punitive in nature. These policies are designed to punish officials responsible and to prevent future harm. But we must also remember that behind every account of mass atrocity or gross violation of human rights, there is a human being who is suffering, an individual with their own lived experience. So I welcome that the Commission turns its attention today to policy solutions that can have a direct positive benefit on people. These are actions we can take that do not depend on the whims of the Chinese government. We can do this. Members of Congress of both parties, of both bodies, have introduced legislation to help those fleeing repression in Hong Kong and Xinjiang find refuge and freedom in the United States. The purpose of this hearing is not to pick one legislative remedy over any other. We are providing a platform to discuss the solutions and hopefully to propel congressional action toward enactment. Some of these measures have passed one body or been included in larger packages. Our goal is to help get them over the finish line. The second purpose of this hearing is to better understand the situation facing those who have fled to third countries. We have read many accounts of Uyghurs in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and Turkey who are vulnerable or at risk for deportation. Many Hong Kongers who have left continue to fear the government, uh, the, fear the government may harass their family who remain there, not to mention those in Hong Kong who fear being jailed under the national security law. So I look forward to hearing what tools we have in our toolbox to help them. Even in the United States, Hong Kongers and Uyghurs are among those who endure long waits for adjudication of their asylum claims. Fixing our broken uh, domestic asylum pr processing system should be a priority. And I'm grateful to, uh, to welcome here uh, our, my colleague in the House, uh, Congressman Tom Melanowski of New Jersey, who has uh, dedicated his life to uh, upholding uh, human rights, uh, not only in China, but around the world. And I'm looking forward to hearing his testimony. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman McGovern. I'd now like to turn to our first panel, Congressman yeah, Tom. Mr. Chairman. I'd now like to turn to our first panel, Congressman Tom Mr. Malinowski. Chairman. Uh, it's Chris Smith, ranking member on the, on the House side. Congressman. Yes, you're recognized. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. This commission and its commissioners have been at the forefront of addressing human rights abuses in both Xinjiang and in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, thank you for convening this very, very important hearing. Indeed, just last week at the Lantos Commission, uh, I presided over a hearing on the sorry state of civil and political rights in Hong Kong, joined by my good friend and colleague, Mr. McGovern. And it was just in 2019 that both the House and Senate passed our versions of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act and the Uyghur Human Rights Act. Both of these bills, while important uh, and are making some difference, only go so far. What is the solution for victims of the most egregious abuses of human rights? A Uyghur who is in a concentration camp, for example, where there are, are well-founded reports of organ harvesting and forced sterilization, or a Hong Kong journalist in jail for exercising what only until recently have been respected as a fundamental right under Hong, Kong, Hong Kong's basic law. Indeed, it has been reported that per capita, there are more journalists in jail in Hong Kong right now than in any country in the entire world. Today's hearing attempts to find solutions for these victims of Chinese Communist Party persecution. First and foremost, by granting asylum to refugees, uh, to oppressed peoples from China's sphere of dominion, 
be they Uyghurs or Kazakhs originally from what has been misleadingly labeled an autonomous region, or Hong Kongers fleeing from what has been a bastion of relative freedom and self-rule guaranteed by international treaty until very recently under Xi Jinping. That freedom has been eroding since uh, a decision by the Standing Committee of the PRC's National People's Congress to pre-screen candidates for Hong Kong's chief executive, which gave rise to the umbrella movement in 2014. I first introduced the Hong Kong and Human Rights and Democracy Act in 2014 during the 113th Congress. Since then, the decline has only accelerated with the extradition law of 2019, when the Hong Kong government proposed extraditing alleged criminals to China, and now with the full force in implementation of the national security law, resulting in the closure of all independent media, including most egregiously, uh, the Apple Daily. <clears throat> in light of this, and even more direct and egregious assaults on human dignity taking place in Xinjiang, we must open our doors more widely to those seeking freedom. Of course, we must ensure proper vetting so that only those who have a legitimate reason to be here are admitted. But what a great opportunity have, has been given to us to encourage China's most talented to come and strengthen uh, the United States. In addition to what has been proposed via humanitarian routes, utilizing P1 and P2 categories for bona fide refugees, I also want to suggest that we ought to be looking at those uh, who can benefit uh, those seeking to flee China for freedom, but also directly benefit Americans while undermining the ability of China to use capital to further its nefarious ends. Namely, there was a provision in the Immigration Reform Act of 1990 that opened the pathway to immigration for those willing to invest money in the United States to create employment for Americans with special inducements for those willing to invest in poverty areas in particular. While the time was not yet right for such a law to be fully utilized when it was first introduced, what we see taking place in Hong Kong, where some 90,000 Hong Kongers immigrated during a one-year period from last year to this, should cause us to revisit this concept. A new category uh, that did not take slots away from deserving refugees, but rather brought capital to the United States to create jobs uh, and could concomitantly drain capital and entrepreneurial talent from China it seems to be a win-win for everyone, except for Xi Jinping and his oppressor cronies. It gives refuge to the talented, creates jobs for Americans, and furthers the strategic objective of draining China of capital. While any such proposal must be examined for its equitable impact and should not be used to diminish our traditional policy of granting refugee, refuge to those fleeing oppression, it can be another tool in the toolbox. And again, look forward to the testimonies of our distinguished witnesses and yield back to balance my time. Thank you very much, Congressman. I'd now like to turn to our first panel, Congressman Tom Malinowski, who represents New Jersey's 7th Congressional District. In addition to being a member of this commission, he is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman Malinowski served as a senior director on President Clinton's National Security Council, a chief advocate for Human Rights Watch, and in the Obama administration as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, where he helped lead America's fight for human rights around the world. Congressman Malinowski, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Senator Merkley, Congressman McGovern. It's uh, great to see you all the way over there. Uh, and a privilege to take part in today's uh, hearing. Thank you so much for convening us, and thank you for your uh, willingness to, to help move good legislation along and, and for continuing to cast uh, a, a necessary light on, uh, on the Chinese government's uh, increasing repression in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Um, and I want to focus particularly on, on Hong Kong today. I think all of us uh, in this Congress, and I think this is a bipartisan consensus, um, see that we are in a contest of ideas between democracy and authoritarianism. And the chief proponent uh, on the world stage of the uh, ideas of authoritarianism today is the Communist Party of China. Hong Kong is a critical battleground in that contest. It plays a role similar to that played by Berlin uh, during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, um, in the sense that it is, a, uh, it is a piece of territory that is important not because of its geographic 
significance necessarily, not because of its military significance necessarily, but because it has stood as an example to the world of how um, democratic ideals can lead to success and prosperity for people who are otherwise, in the case of China, um, denied those principles. Um, it, it sometimes seems as if the policy of the Chinese government today is to ensure that no one who is Chinese can be free anywhere, not just those who are Chinese in mainland China, but those who may be living uh, in a place like Hong Kong, which had enjoyed autonomy, or Taiwan, uh, or people of Chinese descent, even in the United States and Europe, who are increasingly subject to harassment and intimidation from the Chinese government in Beijing. Um, the example that Chinese people can be free and prosperous under a democratic system of government is a great threat to the Chinese government, and so they seek to extinguish it. So that's why Hong Kong is important to us, and I've been thinking a lot about what we can practically do about this, uh, this situation. Um, I support measures, for example, to impose sanctions, other forms of accountability on those who are denying the Hong Kong people their freedom and autonomy. But realistically, I don't think that's going to be enough to deter the Chinese government from continuing on uh, its current uh, path. Um, and therefore, I think we have to focus on what we can practically do to help the Hong Kongers who are trapped in, uh, in this situation. Um, since last summer's crackdown, uh, as you alluded to, I have been trying to advance legislation uh, uh, in the House uh, with Representative Kinzinger and uh, a large group of bipartisan co-sponsors that would offer a broad menu of options to deal with the demolition of Hong Kong's democracy. Um, the Hong Kongers we need to help are in very different uh, situations. Um, some may be protest leaders still in hiding uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, some may be dissidents who have already managed to get out, perhaps to Taiwan. Some may be Hong Kong graduate students uh, working uh, on a degree in the United States who had pro posted critically about the Chinese government on social media. Or some may be Hong Kong business people who are still in Hong Kong and under pressure to tow the party line or lose their businesses. These are all different situations, so my bill aims to provide something for all of them. Um, it provides expedited refugee status for those who are under threat from the new national security law, and we apply the Lautenberg standard, which is the most flexible and I think useful standard under US law to expedite refugee status, allowing people to come based on the categories that they belong to. Uh, it allows for temporary protected status in the United States for Hong Kongers who would be under threat if forced to go back. Uh, it would continue to treat Hong Kong differently from mainland China for immigration cap purposes. Um, and it includes a high skill uh, provision, 5,000 visas for uh, Hong Kongers with skills and, and, and education um, that uh, uh, would enable them to contribute to the United States uh, as they have contributed to Hong Kong. And I'd like to highlight this provision in particular and stress that, that, that this legislation um, and our strategy, in, in my view, should be about more than just providing humanitarian pathways. Yes, we have to help those who need help, who need a place of refuge, but I, I think we, need to, we can be approaching this in a much more strategic way. What I aim to do with these high-skill visas is to send a signal to the Chinese government that if you crush the freedoms of the people of Hong Kong, um, your uh, loss will be our gain. You will lose the best and brightest people uh, in Hong Kong, those who have been the secret to its prosperity and success, to your greatest adversary, the United States. Many other countries are moving in this direction. The United Kingdom has offered um, uh, residence to hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers who meet certain criteria, Canada, Australia, Japan, are moving in this direction. I think collectively, we can send this signal. If you extinguish the prosperity and freedom of Hong Kong, we will allow Hong Kongers to rebuild that prosperity and freedom, in effect, to rebuild Hong Kong in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in Australia. Um, this will communicate to the Chinese government that what they are doing is futile, and it will fail. 
because the freedom that they're trying to extinguish, the example that these amazing people have set in Hong Kong, an example that threatens them, will, will continue in other places. That's the best way to deter the Chinese government, I think, from intensifying repression in Hong Kong, because they will be afraid that even more people will take advantage of these visas, in addition to being the best way of helping the largest number of people who need that help. So with that, um, thank you so much for uh, looking at this bill and for, uh, for helping us advance it, and I yield back my time. Uh, thank you very much, Congressman, and for your uh, very concrete advocacy through your promotion of the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act and the specifics in it. Uh, we're going to have, um, I, th I think we should actually have five minute rounds given the number of people who are waiting rather than, than seven minutes. And um, we have a second panel and we do need to adjourn by 11.50. And so um, we'll just try to keep things moving. I'll encourage people to stick with those five minutes. Uh, so one thing I wanted to ask about, uh, you mentioned TPS for Hong Kongers. And that TPS applies to people who are already in the United States. The administration has granted already deferred enforced departure, and, um, or DED as it's referred to, uh, which gives 18 months of, of protection. Is there any, um, does this essentially provide the equivalent of TPS, although for a shorter period of time? Is it still important to provide TPS itself? I, I would say yes. It's, it's a good step that they've, they've taken. Uh, provides an immediate uh, um, uh, relief from, from anxiety for, for these Hong Kongers who uh, are not going to be forced immediately to go back uh, and, and suffer uh, potential uh, prosecution or persecution for anything they may have said uh, while in the United States. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's realistic uh, to think that this is going to be resolved in 18 months okay. uh, in Hong Kong. And so I think the more permanent, uh, I know it's temporary, but the more long-term uh, protection provided by TPS, I think, would be important. Uh, th thank you. And you mentioned um, the high skill provision, which would enable highly skilled individuals, I think 5,000 positions, to be able to gain admission to the United States. One of the things that China has done in other cases is to take away passports to prevent people from leaving. Is there any sign that China might be inclined to take that strategy to prevent highly skilled Hong Kongers, if you will, from, from coming to the United States? Well, I, I think they are very threatened by this. And, and in a sense, yeah, that should encourage us to move even more rapidly. I think they see exactly what I suggested uh, is the case that um, that their moves in Hong Kong are backfiring in, in, in the sense that the, the, the people who are most responsible for the success, the economic success of Hong Kong are lining up to leave between what the United Kingdom is doing, what we are proposing to do here. So I wouldn't be surprised if they try to make it harder, um, but I think that's an argument for us to move faster rather than slower. Thank you, Congressman, and, and finally, um how does this current situation compare to how we dealt with dissidents or persecuted groups during the Cold War with the former Soviet Union and then with Russia? Uh, thank you for that question. I think it's very analogous. I think at our best during the Cold War, we sought to um, counter the weaknesses of the, of the Soviet communist system with the strengths of our democracy. We did so with confidence. Uh, we stood up for human rights. We held the Soviet Union accountable for its crimes uh, domestically and around the world. Um, but we also took every possible opportunity to open our doors to people from uh, the former Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc countries who sought to come to the United States uh, to make a better life for themselves. One of those people is sitting in front of you right now. My, I came from Poland when it was a communist country at age Six, and I think I've you know, made, a, made a few contributions to the United States. Um, but I think the presence, uh, our willingness to open our doors to, to people of talent and, and imagination from the former Soviet bloc also drained those countries of the talent they needed uh, to maintain uh, their, their success. And the results were seen uh, 
uh, dramatically uh, in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Thank you. Congressman McGovern. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, let me, let me uh, again thank my colleague from New Jersey for, for being here. You know, as I said in my opening remarks, much of, of what we have done in Congress on, uh, in response to the, the growing uh, repression in China has been punitive in nature. I mean, we have uh, passed legislation with targeted sanctions on officials in the Chinese government who are responsible for these policies. And I think, I think that is an appropriate, uh, that has been an appropriate response. But this is about uh, focusing on a people. And, um, you know, and I, uh, and I certainly support what the gentleman is doing. I think the challenge that we have in both the House and Senate is, is, is how do we get these good pieces of legislation enacted? Um, you know, I think this is part of a bigger bill in, in the House. Um, I have some legislation that's part of a bigger bill in the House. Um, but I think um, it's unclear how that bigger bill is going to move. So, um, you know, would the gentleman be in favor of, of us maybe separating some of these pieces of the bigger bill just so we get them done and we get the bigger bill fine. But uh, I, it's hard for me to believe that there are very, very many people, Democrats or Republicans, who would be opposed to your bill. Um, but I mean, I, 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 there are a lot of good ideas that somehow don't ever make it. Uh, and it's sometimes very frustrating. So I'd be interested in your analysis on that. We. We do tend to move slowly, don't we? Yeah. But, um, I am for uh, any pathway that will work. Um, this is part of the larger China bill, the Eagle Act in the House of Representatives. There are a lot of important provisions in that bill that I think many of us would like to see enacted into law. Um, so if the larger bill moves, great. If not, I would be absolutely in favor of separating this and other uh, consensus provisions out. Uh, there to to be frank, there was one objection in the Senate when we tried to move this bill uh, late last year. And um, you know, Senator Merkley knows uh, uh, better, better than us the, the, the particular difficulties of moving things through the Senate if even one senator objects to a piece of legislation. Um, but I think if we can get over that, I would be thrilled if, if this and, and some of the other bills being discussed today could, could be fast-tracked and enacted. Well, and I appreciate that. And again, I'm not necessarily recommending one course or the other. If we can get everything done, that's that's great. Uh, but uh, but I, you know, as I pointed out, I mean, behind all of the atrocities that we talk about and that we highlight are human beings. Um, and many of those people are in the United States and in other countries uh, seeking, at a minimum, temporary peace of mind. Uh, and their families are in jeopardy, and um, and so they, I, th I think, w if in fact we are, um, if we mean what we say about our concern about human rights in China, we need to make sure that we do what we can for those who um, have have left the country. And so, um, anyway, I I support the gentleman's bill. I thank him for his advocacy, and I yield back. Thank you again for your testimony. Congressman Malinowski. And we're going to be turning to our next panel, but it's just a couple comments before we do. Or did we, let me uh, pause for a moment and see if anyone online, uh, any of our members online, had questions for Congressman Malinowski before we proceed? Uh, hearing none, I think we're going to proceed uh, to our second panel. Thank you very much, Congressman. I'd like to highlight two other bipartisan bills relevant to this hearing. The Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act, led by Senator Rubio in the Senate and Congressman Curtis in the House, and the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act, led by Senator Coons in the Senate and Congressman Deutsch in the House. Both are strong bipartisan bills that take some of the steps that we'll be discussing today. The Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act designates certain Hong Kong residents with priority two status for refugee consideration. It exempts Hong Kong refugee admissions from the numerical limitations on U.S. entry, and it makes it easier for Hong Kongers to travel to the United States to declare asylum. 
The Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act would extend the priority to refugee status considerations to Uyghurs and other predominantly Muslim ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. The bill also states that Chinese government retaliation against individuals for seeking U.S. entry, including loss of passport or other travel documents, is not a reason to deny refugee status and could be a basis for consideration of refugee status. I'd now like to turn to our second panel, which will help us understand the context for these bills. Olivia Enos is a senior policy analyst in the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation, where she focuses on human rights challenges in Asia. Her research spans a wide range of subjects, including democracy and governance challenges, human trafficking and human smuggling, religious freedom, refugee issues, and other social challenges in the region. Ms. Enos has a regular column with Forbes magazine. She graduated with a bachelor's in government from Patrick Henry College and a master's in Asian studies from Georgetown University. Sonny Chung is a Hong Kong politician in exile. As a former student leader of the Hong Kong Higher Institutions International Affairs Delegation, he took an active role in the 2019 Hong Kong movement. He testified before the United Kingdom Parliament and U.S. Congress and organized multiple large-scale marches in Hong Kong. Ahead of the 2020 Legislative Council election, he participated and emerged victorious in the Hong Kong Democratic Camp's primaries, which Beijing later declared to be a violation of the national security law. He is now pursuing a master's at John Hopkins University's Palich Nitsi School of Advanced International Studies. Tahir Hamad Isjil is one of the foremost poets in the Uyghur language. He grew up in Kashgar, an ancient city in the southwest of the Uyghur homeland. After attending college in Beijing, he returned to Xinjiang and in the late 1990s and 2000s emerged as a prominent film director, best known for the groundbreaking drama the Moon is a Witness. His poetry has appeared in English translation in the New York Review of Books, in Gulf Coast, in the Berkeley Poetry Review, and elsewhere. In 2017, as the Chinese state began the mass internment of Uyghur intellectuals, he fled with his family to the United States. His memoir, The Uyghur Crisis, Waiting to be Arrested at Night, is forthcoming from Penguin Press, as well as several foreign publishers. We now turn to each of our witnesses in the same order for their testimony. Welcome and thank you each for your championship of human rights. Chairman Markley, Co-Chair McGovern, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Teresa Isaiah Wooden, a female Uyghur camp survivor, described to the BBC the situation she faced while being held in a political re-education camp in China. Zia Wooden said that women were selected nightly and removed from their cells to be raped, even gang raped, by, gang, by camp officials. She spoke not merely as an observer, but as someone who experienced this firsthand. She recounted, you can't tell anyone what happened. You can only lie down quietly. It is designed to destroy everyone's spirit. Today, we know that Uyghurs face ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity. We understand the scope of their plight, many forcibly sterilized, subject to forced abortions, subjugated through forced labor, and detained en masse. There are today between 1.8 and 3 million Uyghurs held in the camps. And Uyghurs are far from the only Chinese citizens facing severe human rights violations. Hong Kongers watched as the freedom they had enjoyed since 1997 and the one country, two systems framework that safeguarded it crumbled. Many Americans observed with admiration as Hong Kongers took to the streets in 2019 and 2020 to defend the liberties they held so dear. When the CCP swiftly instituted the National Security Law, or NSL, the Hong Kong people's futures changed forever. Both Uyghurs and Hong Kongers continue to face persecution at the hands of the CCP, and many policymakers are asking themselves, what can be done? In the midst of intractable crises, the U.S. has a tool at its disposal to practically provide help to those in need, the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, or U.S. RAP. One especially salient tool is conferring the label of a group of special humanitarian concern by extending priority to, or P2, status. 
P2 status has several advantages to its counterpoints, counterparts, a point that I'm happy to dwell on further in Q&A, but I would like to highlight three benefits in particular. First, if granted P2 status, Uyghurs and Hong Kongers would be considered a group of special humanitarian concern. As a member of a P2 category, individuals are a part of a group identified by the U.S. refugee program as of special humanitarian concern, but are still required to prove their individual case of persecution. Previous recipients of P2 include groups from Burma and Thailand, religious minorities from the Middle East, and translators slash individuals who assisted U.S. government in both Iraq and Afghanistan. The designation gives individuals who are a member of this group of special humanitarian concern preference within the refugee admission system. Two, P2 refugees can bypass UNHCR, NGO, and embassy referral. P2 recipients can also apply whether they are inside or outside of their country of origin. This is especially important given that Hong Kong citizens who turned up at embassies or consulates in Hong Kong were often turned away due to intimidation from the CCP, a situation likely to affect Uyghurs as well. Third, P2 refugees receive the same level of stringent vetting as other refugee categories. While P2 refugee applicants can skip the initial referral process, they're subject to normal stringent vetting procedures that are baked into the U.S. refugee program. In fact, P2 refugees follow all of the same protocols except for that referral process that I outlined above. According to the U.S. Department of State's website, PRM makes a preliminary determination as to whether individual applicants qualify for access and should be presented to DHS for interview. Applicants who clearly do not meet the access requirements are screened out even before they have the DHS interview. They are also subject to all the same security and medical checks of every other refugee category. In the midst of long-term crises like the ones facing Uyghurs and Hong Kongers, the U.S. should consider the most applicable tools in its toolbox to provide safe haven. Given this, the U.S. Congress and the executive branch should, first, designate Uyghurs and Hong Kongers priority to processing status. Such a move builds upon the atrocity determination, sanctions against CCP officials responsible for undermining human rights and freedom in both contexts, and is a practical way to alleviate suffering in the midst of intractable crises. Such an option should be extended as soon as possible since Uyghur and Hong Kong lives are presently at stake. Second, the US can't resettle all Uyghurs and Hong Kongers alone. It must build a coalition of allies and partners to resettle them. The Biden administration has identified coordination and cooperation with allies as a key cornerstone of its foreign policy. And one way to act on this commitment is to bring allies into the conversation. Third, the United States should prioritize diplomacy with key countries hosting Uyghurs, including Turkey, Malaysia, Thailand, and Kazakhstan. These countries all face significant pressure from China to deport Uyghurs back to Xinjiang in violation of principles of non-refoulement. The U.S. has the opportunity to tangibly assist Uyghurs and Hong Kongers to demonstrate that we hear their cry for help. Will we answer it? Will we extend safe haven? That choice is ours. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chong? Testing. Chairman Murphy, Co-Chairman McGovern, and members of the Commission, thank you for your kind invitation. It is my honor to testify here again. Two years ago, I was in the same Senate building with my dear friend Joshua Wong and Dennis Ho to explain the summer uprising of the Hong Kongers in 2019 and to push forward the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Two years later, Joshua's life changed within two years, and he just spent his 25th birthday in prison last week, facing four charges, including one under the notorious national security law, the NSL, for which the maximum sentence can be life imprisonment. Artist Dennis Ho, on the other hand, is also living on the edge of being prosecuted. Just within two years, from the fiery uprising to the wintry persecution, Hong Kong is no longer the same, and now I'm here again, unknown without them. I was the lucky one who could escape the political purge, and yet I have to leave my motherland and seek asylum because I become a wanted figure by the Hong Kong government. Recently, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the PRC issued a report blaming the U.S. interference in Hong Kong, just like Chairman Murphy and Co-Chairman McGovern. I was also named 
and denounced in the report by the foreign ministry of the PRC for trice. If I was told two years ago that pro-democracy leaders in Hong Kong would be either in jail or in exile, I would not have believed it as Hong Kong had long been politically different from the PRC. Hong Kong is no longer the same. Last July, I was one of the nominees who emerged victorious in the primary election with Joshua Wong, Gwenif Ho, Lester Shum, Owen Chow, and many, many other outstanding activists. Unfortunately, in January 2021, the Hong Kong government arrested every single one of the participants in the primary election under the, under the NSL, accusing them of subverting the regime. If I had been in Hong Kong, I would have been arrested as well. The mass arrest has almost eradicated the whole pro-democracy camp in Hong Kong and put nearly all of my friends in prison for almost a year without valid reasons. Despite this mass arrest on political leaders, political persecution is still ongoing with an unprecedented scale on the ground. Earlier today, five students from the Chinese University of Hong Kong were charged for rioting and sentenced to four years in jail due to their participation in protecting their university from the siege of the Hong Kong police force two years ago. What happened that day in the CUHK and, and another university, Polytechnic University, had fostered the US Senate to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. However, those courageous students are paying their price just because they want to pursue justice and freedom so badly. One of the students told the judge today that she would not regret for what she did because the law itself is unjust and could not plead her guilty. General, journalists are also in danger. Hong Kong government is planning to introduce a new anti-fake news law to scrutinize the industry. Apparently, the definition of fake news can be freely manipulated by the Chinese government. We can imagine the Hong Kong government will recognize the law one, once again to arrest journalists who dare to report the truth and oversee the government. Another alarming phenomenon is the demise of the interest group in the Hong Kong civil society. In the first nine months of this, of this year, 50 personal groups were, were dismissed. Hong Kong is no longer the same. Many historic groups disappear overnight. For example, the well-known organization the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements of China, which organized the annual June 4th vigil in Victoria Park, was disbanded because Hong Kong police argues the group is an agent of foreign forces and colluding with foreign powers to subvert the regime. There are also more pro-democracy concern groups and neighbor unions, which represent different walks of life in Hong Kong, including teachers, doctors, civil servants, and lawyers are all disbanded due to the worsening political climate in Hong Kong. They all need the urgent help of the US government to escape political threats. As this Congress has made clear, a free and autonomous Hong Kong is in the national interest of the United States. So the US government should provide a safe harbor for those Hong Kongers who have stood up the liberty and suffered the consequences of safeguarding the liberal values that the US Congress has supported Hong Kong people to pursue. When Hong Kong will not return to its heyday anytime soon, preserving Hong Kongers' voices and movements is the best hope for the future rejuvenation of an autonomous Hong Kong. We should remember that it is good to help them survive, but it is equally important to help them build a life. Policy to help them resettle in the US society is necessary. Therefore, I urge the U.S. Congress to pass the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act and the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act to speed up the asylum application process. Moreover, the Congress should encourage the Department of Homeland Security to announce more details of the Deferred and Forced Departure, the DED scheme, due to the President Biden has announced it for two months ago. But the information is still very limited. Lastly, Congress and the administration should work with NGOs, private sectors, and charity groups in the civil society and expand community involvement in settlements of Hong Kongers by robustly promoting community sponsorship. The sooner they settle in, the sooner they can give back to the United States. Hong Kong, Hong Kong is no longer the same, but the lion heart to survive and strive for freedom are always the same. No matter where we are, we will not give up. I come here alone, but we will walk out together. I have been in exile for more than a year. 
but I can still remember the city landscape of Hong Kong and the name and faces of my dear friends who are now political prisoners. I will not forget them, and I hope the U.S. will not forget them. I will stand on the side of our brave Hong Kongers, the side of human dignity and liberty. This is the revolution of our time. We will liberate our Hong Kong. Please stand with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chong. And now we'll turn to the testimony of Mr. Isjil, and he will have a simultaneous translator uh, to uh, uh, help convey the, the essence of his remarks. Welcome. We're just going to check and make sure your microphone is turned on so that we can make sure your remarks are, are heard. Testing. Good morning. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify. Chunki Nurgunlan Bash Uyurlan passport startup, Khta Yukumitan Yugulish Lagal Kamal Galke, Yaki, Chatelgich Yuli Italian, Mang of Shesh Persetki Shambede. In the spring of twenty seventeen, the Chinese Communist government launched a large scale detention of Uyghurs and other local ethnic groups. In August of the same year, I fled to the United States to seek asylum for the safety of my family and myself. I was one of a very few lucky Uyghurs who was able to leave at that time. Many other Uyghurs could not get the same opportunity. They couldn't get passports or their passports were confiscated. They lost the ability to travel abroad and they were interned in concentration camps established by the Chinese government. Passport bermeslik Xitoy hukumatining Uyghurlarning chetlarga chiqib panalishni to'sish uchun qo'llangan eng muhim tadbirlarning biridir. Erkin Asiya radiosi bilan Uyg'ur kishilik huquq qurilishi 10 yil burunla sayat erkinligiga daxl ta'riz qilingan bu xil qilmishni kang ko'lamda xabar qilgan edi. Refusal to give passports to Uyghurs is one of the most important methods enforced by the Chinese government to inhibit Uyghurs from taking refuge abroad. Radio Free Asia and the Uyghur Human Rights Project reported extensively 10 years ago on this violation of the right to travel freely. 2015 the Chinese government began confiscating passports from the very few Uyghurs who had them. The confiscations initially started with the passports of Uyghurs who worked in the government. The large-scale detention in 2017 marked the beginning of confiscations of ordinary citizens' passports. However, even Uyghurs who have been able to go abroad, despite such obstacles, still have great difficulty in achieving secure living conditions. Men Amerikada panalik iltimas qigil tuyatjil oldi. Ama minin iltimasim et ikhtas qilanmidi. It has been four years since I applied for asylum here in the United States and I still have not received asylum. My two daughters' Chinese passports expired in 2019, and they have no official status here. Some Uyghurs in the United States have been waiting for asylum status for seven or eight years, although some Uyghur Americans are living in safe conditions and have work opportunities in the United States. Many have not been granted legal residency status, and they are going through many hardships and anxieties. Many continue to receive threats from the Chinese government. 
Dünyanın her kaç çaylırdaki sersan bulup yürüvatkan uyğurla insani yardımge ve bihatler makangı muhtaç. Olanın inıksız ve xatarlık takdiri çeteldeki uyğur cemaatin endişki sanmaqta. Meselen, 50'den artık panalık tülgen uyğur Tayland türmelerde tutup durulmaqta. Olanı işkanda devlet kubuklu mayvatıdı. Türkiye'de neçü 10 mu uyğur kanunluq salayetki erişenmey, ya ki başka devletlerge kitemmey ve hemişçide yaşamaqta. Uyghurs elsewhere around the world are in dire need of humanitarian assistance and resettlement to a safe place. These refugees' precarious fate is a huge worry for Uyghur diaspora communities. For example, more than 50 Uyghur asylum seekers are being held in prisons in Thailand, with no country willing to take them. Tens of thousands of Uyghurs in Turkey are living in fear of being unable to obtain legal status or being unable to relocate to another country. Çeteldeki Uyghurlar kuludaki pastı Kıhtay pasportunun vaxtı tosla zor xatar içi de kalıdı. Çünkü Kıhtay hükümeti olanı kastan uzatıp bəmeydi. Hükümet taraf bu Uyghurların çoxu Kıhtay'a bir pasport yanlaştı buyuruydu. Halbuki Kıhtay pukraları Elçikana ya Konsulukana arqılıqla pasportlarını yanlayalaydı. Uyghur kişilik oku kuruluşu bunu pasportunun kuralıqa aylandırılışı edip atıqan. Saudi Arabistan'ı Arab Birleşmi Xalipiliki Mısır Qatarlıq devletlerdeki pasportunun vaxtı ötken Uyghurlar eğer kıyınçılık içi tutulmaqda. Çünkü ola başka devletler gibi kitemmeydi. Hem de şu devletler de mu panalıq salayeti gibi erişenmeydi. Ola ızcıl tırdı korkunç ve Kıhtay'a ötküzüp birleşinin ve hemisici de yaşamaqta. Uyghurs who are abroad are in great danger when their Chinese passports expire. This is because the Chinese government has deliberately refused to renew them. The government tells Uyghurs they must go to China for renewal, unlike Han Chinese citizens who can renew their passports at a Chinese embassy or consulate. The Uyghur Human Rights Project called this the weaponization of passports. Uyghurs living in countries such as Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Egypt are experiencing great hardships after their passports expire because they don't have a valid passport to travel anywhere else. But at the same time, they cannot get asylum status. They live in constant fear of being extradited to China. Türkiye'de işkizden artık Uyghur BDT Musafirla Mekemesi'nin Musafirla Lager'da bir xatar panagahlarını saklayıp yeti vatıdı. Afganistan'ın Kabul'da yüzden artık Uyghur ailesi Taliban hakimiyeti bilen yeğen münasibetteki Kıhtay hükümetinin tähdiyeti tüpeyledin kıyın ahvalda duru vatıdı. Tolumu xatarlık bulu vatkını şu ki, bazı hükümetler şu devletlerdeki Musafir Uyghurlarını Kıhtay bilen soğudul işidigan dəsmayıqa aylandıru almaqda. In Turkey, more than 200 people have been waiting in UNHCR refugee camps to be granted safe haven. In Afghanistan, more than 100 Uyghur families in Kabul are living in horrendous streets in great fear of Chinese government, which has close ties with the Taliban regime. The danger is that some governments are treating Uyghur refugees as assets to bargain with China over a variety of interests. Bu pacalanın tüp menbesi del Kıhtay hükümetinin Uyghurla karatkan irki kırgınçılık odur. Amerika hükümeti ve başka bir neç garip devletlerinin parlamentleri Uyghur irki kırgınçılıkın resmi itiraf kılgan akvalda, halkara cemiyet çetelerde sersan bulup yüge Uyghurlağa insanperverlik yardımı birip olağı iyi buluş gerek. The root cause of these tragedies is the Chinese government's genocide against the Uyghurs. While the US government and several Western parliaments formally recognize the Uyghur genocide, the international community must do more and provide humanitarian assistance to Uyghurs abroad, who are the victims of these crimes against humanity. Ağırda, mən dövlət məclisini Amerika hükümeti Uyghur kırgınçılıqını etiraf kılgan ahvalda, Uyghur panalıq iltimaslarının şünki uzun yıl albomasıqının səhəbini tep çıxışı çakırım mən. In conclusion, I urge the Congress to find out why Uyghur's U.S. asylum applications have been in limbo for so many years, at the time when the US government has recognized the genocide. Amerika Devlet Meclisi'nin kanun çıkırıp, dünyanın her kaysi jaylarda sersan bop yügen Uyghurlani bir xatar makangı eriştirişi nait təxirsizdir. Kıhtay'nın Uyghurlar karatkan irki kırgıncılıkın toxtışka ünümlük tətbir ilinmay vatkan muşundak bir peyitdə, bu kanunun təstiqlinişi qiyin şarayı tutur vatkan Uyghurlağa azraq bosumu ümit beğişlişi mümkün. It's also urgent that the U.S. Congress pass a law to provide safe resettlement for Uyghur refugees around the world. At this time, when effective measures have not been taken to end Chinese genocide against the Uyghurs, it will give Uyghurs some hope for the future if the Congress passes a U.S. law to bring refugees to safety. Rahmat. Thank you. Thanks so much to, uh, to each of you for bringing your 
life experience and your expertise to the US Congress and to this commission. To clarify where we're at now, in regards to individuals from Hong Kong, the administration has granted deferred enforced departure, which means that those who are here in the United States are protected for 18 months, but is not granted P2 status. In regard to those who are in exile, the Uyghurs from China, uh, there is neither deferred enforced departure nor P2 status. So I, I want to then focus on this P2 status question. Ms. Enos, um, you, you laid out the advantages of that, that people can apply from inside or outside the, the country, that there is a significant uh, vetting. Uh, they have to show their individual persecution, but they qualify as part of a, a group. What is the Biden administration's current position on establishing P2 status for those from Hong Kong and for Uyghurs? Um, thank you for that question. That I know of, um, the Biden administration has not taken action in order to extend P2 status. As you mentioned, for Hong Kongers, they do have that DD status, which is almost equivalent to TPS. Um, it just stems from a different authorizing executive branch. Um, so Hong Kongers obviously do have the ability to come here to work um, and to stay here without fear of deportation. But for Uyghurs, that is not the case. Um, in my mind, and, and uh, please pardon me if this goes beyond the scope of the question, uh, both TPS and humanitarian parole, which is another option that has been raised, um, neither are applicable to Hong Kongers and Uyghurs um, for many reasons, but principally because they only provide temporary relief. Um, they don't actually provide long-term relief in the way that a priority two status does. And I think it's very difficult to argue that a permanent law like the national security law or the long-standing persecution of Uyghurs that long predates our 2017 knowledge of the camps is in any way temporary. So we should be looking, the US government, the Biden administration, Congress should be looking for long-term options that give Uyghurs and Hong Kongers permanent safe haven. Thank you. Turning to Mr. Chung, you noted in your written testimony that those who were with you when you testified here before, Joshua Wong, Denise Ho, that Joshua Wong is behind bars because of pernicious national security law, and Denise Ho is living on, as you term, the edge of being prosecuted. Uh, so uh, uh, kind of day-to-day -day fear. And uh, that this exists for so many of those you know who took to the streets to defend the democratic liberties of Hong Kongers. You have noted the importance of uh, P2 status as, as well, um, but you have uh, also noted that we need to give additional help uh, to help people become stabilized once they reach the United States. Could you clarify your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, thank you for your question. Um, to clarify about my um, statement, is it actually about um, we, ha we have to uh, try to help Hong Kongers in the United States to resettle in the society. Because we know that uh, we are fully discerned that um, currently we have the DED program, but since um, the Department of the Homeland Security has not allowed any details of the DED yet, so actually uh, so many Hong Kongers are still quite desperate um, in the United States, try to figure out how to settle down and how to have a uh, life here. And then on the other hand, uh, it is really important for them to settle down in the US. For example, I've met and encountered so many young dissidents right now in the US, and currently um, they, 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 they find that um, they, they cannot afford to buy insurance, they cannot uh, afford a tuition fee. So if, in order to help them to transit, to relocate to, into the US, and the sooner they settle down, the sooner they can contribute back to the US. So what we are asking is not about, I mean, granting all the Hong Kongers a green card or asylum status. What we want is really help those people who, uh, who are in political danger and then try to help them to settle down in the US as soon as possible. Thank you. And many Hong Kongers have the, uh, the legal status to be able to go to the United Kingdom. 
and we're seeing, I think, uh, thousands have, is China moving to, to block uh, people from leaving Hong Kong to go to the United Kingdom? For the previous months, actually, there are still many regulations and um, from the governments trying to block and uh, trying to deter Hong Kong people from leaving Hong Kong. For example, um, when, they, we, uh, when they leave Hong Kong, um, actually, there are lots of Hong Kong police force now patrolling uh, in the Hong Kong airport. And they will actually um, um, stop by and try to um, search those um, Hong Kong people. And some Hong Kong people, when they even uh, leave uh, Hong Kong and try to relocate to the UK, actually, they cannot receive uh, um, their retirement uh, uh, fee, and they can no longer uh, benefit from the Hong Kong government welfare scheme for some people. And that's why you can see that, and you can tell that the Hong Kong government is trying to do something to deter them from leaving Hong Kong. And this is really alarming because I mean, the situation in Hong Kong is getting more uh, uh, frustrating. But then on the other hand, if um, the BNO system or the asylum system in the US cannot help Hong Kong people who have political threats, and that will be miserable. Thank you. And Mr. Isjil, you've noted that you've been seeking asylum for, for four years. What is the holdup? Men bunu sebebini bilmeyim. Men Amerika'ya iş kimi oyetik ergen çağırdılar. Xeli köp uyğurla üzünki panalı ıltımasını saklağı tutup diken. Yani iş kimi 13. yıldan başlapla xeli köp sandık uyğurlarının panalı ıltıması cıgılıp kalan iken. I don't know the reason. When I came to the United States in 2017, there are a lot of Uyghurs been waiting for the asylum case decision. It's been backlogged since 2013. Thank you. And are, are you then in a situation where you have any, are you, do you have legal residency status or do you have any uh, legal status in the U.S. now? I know you noted your, your daughters do not, uh, but are you also in similar limbo? Uh, Şunda minin mazır aşında menem de Amerika hükümeti ve halkının ki uygulağı müşahede emgep kılış üzünün turmuşunu kaydetim başlaş burası belgelik ile internet rahmet eğitime ama bizden ki hazır ki salay eğitimiz inik sızalet tuturu atımız minin ahvalım mı şu kızlarımın ahvalı okşaş gerçi minin pasportumun vakti etmeyen bozu mu ama ıltın basım testlanma kaçka meyyanala ya da hatırcam alet de emez. I really appreciate this uh, U.S. government and the people to give us work here, but my status is, so I don't have legal status here as well, just like my daughters. And I've been waiting for my asylum uh, case decision. Thank you for sharing your personal story because it creates a vision into the situation of uh, so many Uyghurs who are here in the United States. And I also really appreciate your your, uh, your clarification of the challenge. So many, as you put it, tens of thousands of Uyghurs in Turkey are in fear of being unable to obtain legal status. Uh, I am going to uh, uh, pass the baton here to Congressman McGovern, uh, but I just want to note that uh, it seems like there's a, a very strong case uh, for us to address all of those like yourself who are in, in limbo with no legal status and here you've been applying for, for four years. It's just unacceptable and um, that's why we're holding this hearing is to explore these issues and how the United States should address um, proper advocacy for, for human rights, particularly in regard to Hong Kong and in regard to China. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, again, th let me thank all the witnesses for your, your testimony. Um, it reinforces a frustration, I think, that I have, that many of us have, that um, we're moving too damn slow here in Congress, that we need to do more, the administration needs to do more. Um, but somehow, sometimes the, the nature of this system is that one person or, or you know, a small group of people can hold things up. And, um, and there's also the issue that, um, you know, that if, if we're going to take care of um, Hong Kongers and Uyghurs, then what about this group or what about that group? I mean, there's a lot of people we need to take care of. 
but if we can all agree that this is a priority, you know, the old saying goes, you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. Let's get to something we agree on done. I don't, I, it's hard for me to fathom, uh, given what we read in the papers every day, given the reports from human rights organizations, giving your testimony, that, there, that, that anybody believes that there isn't a sense of urgency to provide protection to people um, uh, who are fleeing these terrible situations. So, so we gotta figure this out um, and we gotta move faster. We, administration needs to do more um, and we certainly need to do more here. Um, and whether, if that's legislation that we need to pass, let's figure out how to do it and get it to the president's desk. Now let me ask a question here. Regarding governments that may be tempted to accede to Chinese government requests to, to deport Uyghurs to China, where, where, you know, where we all agree they would face uh, a dire fate, what tools does the United States government have to persuade or deter governments from uh, refouling them? I mean, are there any applicable sanctions on individuals who abet the refoulement? Um, and, uh, you know, governments of some Muslim-majority countries have received pushback against their attempts to cooperate with China on the repatriation of Uyghurs uh, due to public sympathies for the plight of Uyghurs in China in their countries. Are, are policy options available to the United States government regarding promoting civil society actions um, in these countries that support Uyghurs? Maybe Ms. Enos will begin with you. Um, absolutely. So China is notorious for violating the principles of non-refoulement. And in fact, China is a signatory to the UN Refugee Convention in which they agreed not to engage in refouling individuals. They do this in the North Korean context, um, and of course they've done this with Uyghurs. Um, I think we need to increase pressure, and I think um, you know the Biden administration has said that they view working with allies and partners as a cornerstone of their foreign policy efforts. I think that there should be much more political will um, internationally, and I think we've even seen some encouraging multilateral action um, earlier this year when uh, the EU, the UK, Canada, and the US all sanctioned individuals in China for the role that they played in committing genocide, ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity against Uyghurs. There might be a role for the UN since technically um, China is violating the UN principle of non-refoulement. But I think that it's going to take U.S. leadership to draw together our allies in order to put pressure on China, either in the U.N. context uh, or perhaps uh, beyond. Global Magnitsky sanctions um, may actually be applicable here, so perhaps something worth looking into. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I think I can um, have a response to that. Um, I think regarding the situation, I think... Um, more uh, U.S. sanctions from the Biden administration will be really helpful because uh, currently, I think um, the Hong Kong government feels, uh, feels like they are winning. I mean, they are winning because people are fleeing and then people are leaving and then almost all the political activists and leaders are now in prison. So um, the CCP, the Hong Kong government, think that they are winning. So in order to hold them accountable, I think that is really important for the U.S. government to have strategic sanctions um, regarding um, the individuals, officials, and also about those state-owned companies, and also from a more global um, landscape, uh, we should also boycott the Winter Olympic uh, of 2022. Because when we try to do something like this to be assertive, and then we can create more pressure on uh, the Hong Kong government and Beijing government that uh, Hong Kong people are not alone and the U.S. will not uh, try to uh, keep silence and you will actively try to help Hong Kongers with your allies in the world. May I just add here really quickly? Yes. I put out a report earlier this year at Heritage um, pressing on Congress to postpone and move the elections, uh, or, or excuse me, um, the Olympics in Beijing. So I wanted to echo um, Sunny's call. I think it would be a good move to postpone 
and move the elections and it, or end the Olympics. And short of that, um, a diplomatic boycott could be a good secondary option that sends a, a signal to China and embarrasses China on the international stage that they should not be able to host or have the honor of hosting the most privileged sporting event uh, in the world. Well, let me echo what you just said and what Mr. Chung just said. I mean, we I feel the same way. I mean, the bottom line is we, if you can postpone the Olympics for a year because of a pandemic, you ought to be able to postpone them because of a genocide, among other things. So um, I think my, my, uh, my time has expired, but I want to thank all of you for your excellent testimony. I yield back. Thank you. We now turn to Senator John Ossoff of Georgia. And we're pausing while, because he's out there in, in Zoom land. I'm told online currently, so we'll give him a moment, and if not, then we're going to turn next to uh, Congressman Smith. So Congressman Smith, please be ready. Okay, we're going to turn to Congressman Smith. We'll go to, to Senator Ossoff uh, afterwards. Congressman Smith. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I really want to thank our distinguished witnesses. They have been extraordinary, very, very incisive, and again, to Olivia Enos's comments just a moment ago about the Olympics and my good friend, uh, Jim McGovern, uh, you and I, Mr. Chairman, we've all hold, held hearings. We're asking uh, that the venue be changed, postponement. Uh, I mean, it is outrageous with a genocide that is ongoing as we talk uh, that, that the country, Xi Jinping's uh, dictatorship should be host, hosting the Olympic Games. It's just absolutely um, uh, unconscionable. So, uh, I appreciate their, you know, our distinguished witnesses focusing at least a little bit on that. I would like to ask um, Olivia Enos uh, if she could, you know, so I should say, uh, about, you know, she very, you very strongly talk about the different uh, uh, options that are available, including TPS, uh, which you think is not the way to go. Of course, it is a way to go, but not the, the way to go. Um, you, you talk about the Lautenberg Amendment uh, as being primarily for family unification. So that's likely not going to be uh, a viable alternative. On humanitarian parole, um, you, you give you know the up and down side of that. And, um, but you really, really, like I believe myself, think that P2 is the way to go. And um, there is a bill, it's been languishing. And I think um, uh, Jim McGovern's point about how we've been a little slow coming out of the gate that was introduced last January 25th by Congressman Curtis uh, I am one of the co-sponsors of it, one of many bipartisan co-sponsors, H.R. 461, that would designate um, a, a, a P2 status. Uh, so maybe if you could elaborate a little bit further on that, Ms. Enos, uh, um, please, uh, about why that is the preferred position. Uh, you do it in your written testimony, and I, I think we all deeply appreciate that. Uh, you also talk about building a coalition uh, of allies and partners to resettle Uyghurs and Hong Kongers. Uh, who are in need. Uh, and I would also, if in your answer, if you could, uh, how hard will it be for a person in Hong Kong and how even harder will it be for someone uh, in Xinjiang uh, to avail themselves in any way, shape, or form of a P2 status? Uh, I remember, you know, I cut my eye teeth on human rights issues uh, on the immigration of Soviet Jews. My first trip to the Soviet Union was in 1982 was uh, on behalf of Soviet Jewry. And as we all remember, um, as Soviet Jews came out um, or even tried to emigrate, they were then charged uh, with crimes by the Soviet state uh, for just wanting uh, to leave. Uh, so maybe you could just touch on, in a practical term, uh, terms, how would the P2 work for anyone still inside of Hong Kong uh, and even more difficult inside of Xinjiang? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so just to like very briefly summarize why I don't think the other three options would work for TPS, it's tempor it's typically for a temporary situation, which I mentioned, I don't think the Hong Kong situation 
or the Uyghur situation is at all temporary. And with TPS, you don't have the ability to get um, LPR status, um, which is really, you know, that's the permanent path. Um, also, TPS is typically granted by the executive branch and not by Congress, um, although, of course, there have been some examples in the past where this is the case. And then in the Hong Kong situation, I actually believe that TPS um, is duplicative of the DED status that Hong Kongers already have. And while I agree with Sunny that there should be greater clarity on how DED works in practice for Hong Kongers, I think that DED and TPS essentially do the same thing. They offer temporary safe haven. Um, on the humanitarian parole um, option, this is supposed to be used only in emergency cases. This is supposed to be case by case individual for very discreet reasons like needing emergency medical care or um, uh, needing to testify in a court case or there's an earthquake back in your home. It's a very discreet case and once that situation is over, that person doesn't have a pathway to stay here permanently. Um, and as I mentioned also with the Lautenberg Amendment, um, it's actually a part of P2 status but it's supposed to be only in kind Country processing. It's principally for individuals with family members and in the past has only been used for religious minorities, which means that it would likely only apply to Uyghurs. For those reasons, I think that P2 is, the, is a far superior option. One, it is a actually permanent option for individuals to come here. Two, they don't have to have UNHCR, NGO, or NBC referral, which means that they can go directly um, outside, inside or outside of their country, and most Uyghurs and most Hong Kongers would be processed outside of their country um, because they can't go to a consulate um, within China. And so to me, this is the preferred option. It's the safest option. It's the one where vetting um, is in place, just like all other refugee categories. And so I think that P2 is the best of the available options. Can I just ask you just one follow-up? Uh, it's my understanding that USCIS and PRM uh, could initiate this. Is that your understanding? It does not take an act of Congress? I believe that it can be done by the executive branch, but I would need to you, double check. As that. we move towards the legislative uh, solution, uh, which would obviously be a good one, but it's languished since January, uh, perhaps we could reach out collectively, uh, maybe with a letter to the administration asking that they just do this. Uh, Absolutely. That's my understanding of, of what is available. And it would, it would have an enormous positive impact on those who are suffering. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you uh, to our distinguished witnesses. And thank you, Congressman, very much for that suggestion. And I, I think that uh, following on this, this hearing, we should absolutely have that discussion about Wayne Wynn with the administration about executive action on P2 status. We're now turning to uh, Congressman Malinowski. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chung, I wanted to ask you um, about uh, Hong Kongers who are leaving today. Uh, we've not acted yet, but the United Kingdom uh, in particular has. I, I, I wonder if you could just describe what is happening right now, who is leaving. Uh, it's, I understand, not just protest leaders. It's a much broader group of Hong Kongers. Why are they leaving? And what impact is that having on Hong Kong's society and economy? Thank you for your question, Congressman. Um, I think the key reason why Hong Kong people are leaving right now is about the right terror. You are right about that. Actually, not just the protester or not just the political activists are leaving. Actually, more and more Hong Kongers from different uh, uh, disciplines and different fields are leaving. The reason for that is because, uh, for example, when we look at and investigate the contents of the national security law, it does not just mention about political persecution. It does not just mention about how to uh, punish or try to, uh, uh, try to uh, punish activists who collude with foreign uh, uh, powers. From the NSL, it's also mentioned about the government should do something to, um, to scrutinize the education, to scrutinize secondary school and primary school. And that's why, from my understanding, many teachers from secondary school and from primary school in Hong Kong are actually leaving because they believe that 
under uh, the supervision of the Hong Kong government. They can no longer talk about politics in classroom, otherwise they can be reported and they can be uh, like uh, being reported and their uh, uh, certificate of being a teacher can be terminated by the government. Mm. And not just about the teacher, um, civil servants, uh, businessmen, many professionals, accountants, uh, both, all of them are actually facing this kind of white terror because in Hong Kong nowadays, if you dare to say something to pro, uh, something similar to pro-democracy, or if you say something dare to uh, criticize the government uh, immense, uh, immensely, and then uh, people, if they report you to the authority, and you can, uh, you can be summoned to the police authority, and you can be also, your job can also uh, be, uh, be lost because um, under the uh, white terror. And that's why it explains many people are leaving. And then lastly, when we want to uh, examine how these people living will impact the Hong Kong economy and society, I will say that um, for the civil society, of course, it will be really um, devastating because many talents and many political activists have to be in exile or either in jail. Um, however, there are still people, there are some people still living, remaining in Hong Kong, try to be resilient and try to do some underground um, advocacy and, 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 and uh, pol uh, a political projects in order to keep the uh, momentum of the movement. And on the other hand, for the economy, uh, for, the, uh, econo for the economy, uh, we witness many people try to immigrate to other countries, bringing their capital and assets. So uh, we believe that actually, if the U.S. government, speaking of that, can also try to absorb this kind of um, talent and professionals, and you can also bring in their assets and capital to the U.S. and try to contribute to the U.S. society more. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you, you suggested that the, the Chinese authorities are threatened by this, that it, this is, they're not just happy that all of these troublemakers are leaving for good, that, that they are actually beginning to try to discourage it, which suggests it's exactly what we should be doing. Would, would you agree? Indeed. And I think um, but now Xi Jinping is becoming more assertive right um, at the moment, especially uh, before uh, next year when he tried to, I mean, seek for the third term uh, um, of the, um, the leader of the Communist Party. And that's why he has to be assertive on Hong Kong issues. And currently, actually, according to a statistic uh, conducted by the American Chamber in Hong Kong, more than 40% of the U.S. companies want to live and want to relocate to Singapore or other regions in Asia. And Hong Kong government actually knows about this uh, statistic. But they actually, they, does not, they do not care about that. And they want these troublemakers to live. And this is really alarming because they are actually killing the autonomy and economy of Hong Kong. Thank you. And again, I think it's a strong argument for us to move quickly before the, the, the Chinese government makes it even harder for people to take advantage of, of, these, um, of these visas. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. And uh, Senator Ossoff is not back from his questioning uh, in the Banking Committee. So we're turning to uh, Congresswoman Steele. And we will pause to see if you are there, Congresswoman. And if not, just a heads up, I'll also see if uh, Congressman Wexton, Congresswoman Wexton, and uh, Congressman Mast uh, are uh, ready to ask questions. Thank you very much. Uh for give, uh, giving me a chance. And thank you all witnesses coming out today. The human rights abuses happening in China right now should horrify every one of us. Chinese Communist Party leaders have taken over Hong Kong and have destroyed the rule of law. The CCP has ended the liberal free enterprise system that has defined Hong Kong's success. For the democracy leaders are being targeted and arrested while many journalists are being barred from reporting the news. The world has also witnessed the Hong Kong police force abuse their power and attack nonviolent protesters. Hong Kongers have a right to freedom. The, that right was taken away by the CCP. I have supported the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act to provide temporary protected status to Hong Kongers in the United States. The Chinese Communist Party continues to engage in horrific human rights abuses. We cannot turn 
a blind eye to the forced labor and torture of the Uyghurs and oppression of minorities. Uyghurs face ongoing crimes against humanity, including forced, forcible sterilization and forced abortion, forced labor, and genocide. I have called on the International Olympic Committee to pull the 2022 Winter Olympics from Beijing because the goal of the Olympic is to promote a peaceful society concerned with the preservation of human dignity. Yet the Chinese Communist Party undermines human dignity with the brutal practices and the wrongdoing must not be awarded. I sit on this committee with the purpose of holding the Chinese Communist Party accountable for its horrific crimes. Having said that, I have a few questions to the witnesses. The, <clears throat> the first one is, can you share how the CCP profits or gaining from the exploitation of the Uyghurs who are subjecting to forced, forced labor in Xinjiang? I think any witnesses can answer this. I can I can go first. Um, thank you for that question. Um, we know that uh, the Chinese Communist Party carries out severe forms of forced labor. Forced labor is happening both in the context of the camps. There are many camp adjacent facilities where there are factories that actually share space um, with the political re-education camps that the CCP runs. We know that there are at least um, 260 of those camps that BuzzFeed identified in, uh, in their reporting, and that a significant percentage of those camps do have um, facilities that are used for forced labor. We also know that the CCP runs forced labor transfer camps. Um, Adrian Sens from the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation produced a report where he said that he believes at least, I think it was 1.6 million Uyghurs are at risk um, of, of being subject to forced labor um, through forced labor transfer programs. And so we know this is a substantial problem. We do know that the CCP profits off of it. And we also know that, um, as you mentioned in your comments, that the CCP is still going to be able to potentially host the Winter Olympics. Um, I think we should be undertaking far greater efforts to tackle forced labor, making tools, making use of the tools that the Customs and Border Protection has um, through withhold release orders that should arguably be um, expanded. Um, and then we also should be calling into question Beijing's ability to host the Olympics. Um, just a reminder, the Olympics is a money-making venture. Um, and so NBC does have the option to choose not to broadcast the Olympics and to not make it profitable, um, especially not to broadcast the opening ceremonies, which we know from the 2008 Olympics were merely a propaganda opportunity for the Chinese government. So I think we need to absolutely tackle all of the ways that the CCP is profiting from exploitation, but especially the ways in which it's, it's doing so against the Uyghurs and, and Hong Kongers. I think moving uh, the location itself from Beijing to another safety, you know, safe uh, cities, I think that's much more preferred. But you know, uh, they said they are still going on, and then I, I'm very much concerned about safety of our athletes because how they can be guaranteeing that our athletes, not just ours, but all over the world, the athletes, that their safety is the most concern when they going into China. My second question is, how can Congress identify and determine the percentage of goods produced in Xinjiang that made with forced labor? Um, so I think that uh, the Customs and Border Protection has a range of tools that are available to it. Um, one are withhold and release orders. Um, actually, there are current withhold release orders for, I believe, um, both the cotton and the tomato industries. I think arguably, and, and I have a report actually that my colleague Tori Smith and I put out, that those withhold release orders should be expanded um, to the entire Xinjiang region for a period of two years. So that CBP 
can produce a report telling us what percentage of goods that they apprehended our border um, coming and originating from Xinjiang are produced with forced labor. And if it's over a certain percentage, I think that at that point, you would have a solid justification um, for uh, creating a rebuttable presumption that all goods uh, produced in Xinjiang are produced with forced labor. And the details of that are in um, a heritage report that I'm happy to submit um, afterwards if that's helpful um, to you. But I think those would be some of the most valuable and immediate tools. Those can either be authorized by Congress or, frankly speaking, the executive branch could be doing so uh, as we speak. Thank you very much. Love to have that, um, you know, information or data. And Thank you, Congressman Steele. We're going to turn to uh, uh, Senator Ossoff, but we're happy to come back to you for a second round if you Thank choose you. to stay with us. Thank you. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, would like to discuss with the witnesses, specifically Ms. Chung and Mr. Isgil, um, the tools and tactics that the CCP uses to surveil and intimidate uh, dissidents abroad, as well as the uh, threat of reprisal against those dissidents' um, relatives who uh, remain in the PRC. Ms. Chung, could you please comment on this? Sure. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think the Chinese Communist Party right now is really good at using, um, creating white terror and then to um, try to, I mean, um, uh, repress and keep those um, dissidents um, uh, um, um, silent. And that's why uh, we hope that um, the U.S. Um, government can also try to uh, help um, dissidents uh, who remain uh, on the ground, especially student activists younger than us who are now still remaining uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, currently, because uh, many student campuses um, have been colluding with uh, the PLC, and then the point, the, the problem is that um, many student activists, they no longer receive the support from the um, university administration. And that's why this is also a, a way for the PLC to crack down on the student activism in Hong Kong and in which actually student activism has been one of the most uh, fundamental and essential fabric uh, of our uh, civil society. If student activists do not have the support uh, of the school authority and the school authorities choose to uh, collude with the PRC in order to arrest student activists and leaders right now, and that will be miserable. And not just exist uh, in campus, but also in other domains when um, the PRC is trying to uh, use different kinds of uh, uh, means, try to create pressure to those, um, um, uh, to, to those uh, companies and employers to ask them uh, to monitor and oversee the status uh, of their employees. So that makes really a horrifying situation that actually no one is safe in Hong Kong to publicly voice their uh, political opinions. And this is alarming. And that's why we should I mean, stand with Hong Kong people and try to counter uh, the CCP uh, uh, controls over this kind of school campuses, business uh, circle, and other uh, domains. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chung. And uh, uh, Mr. Isgil, uh, could you comment on uh, the same question, uh, the tactics, the technology, the policies uh, that are um, used by the CCP to target uh, dissidents and critics of uh, PRC policy who, who may be outside of Chinese territory but have family within China. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, social uh, media la yaki uh, ijtimai alaq vastar arqluq uh, nazarat qiludu the chinese government in general monitors Uyghurs abroad through applications such as wechat and other apps bunun da asaslıqı uyghurlarınki yurtidiki uruq tuqqallarını atanlarını görege elbiliş yak ulaq besim işiltish the 
they normally hostage their relatives and family members of the Uyghurs and or threatening them to take them to concentration camps, also giving a lot of pressure to the uh, dissidents. Anandikin Yekundi Baikalgan Bazi Uchula Karan Chagda Facebook Katarluk Bazi Halakradiki Night Dangluk Ishtamay Alak Vastlanangmo uh Tai Yukumitige Baz Uchulan Tamila Pagaliki Inak Bo Arkalakmo Uyurla Nazarat Kludum. Recently we also learned that famous social media apps like Facebook is also helping the Chinese government to provide some of the essential information of the Uyghur people. Anadikiana telephone ve başka tor alak vasıtlarımı Xitay hükümetinin çeteldik Uyghurlar nazarat kıldıran muhim vasıtları. Phone calls and other methods are also the ways that Chinese government monitor the Uyghurs. Rahmet. Thank you. Thank you and uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much Senator Congressman Wexton. Thank you, Senator, for convening this hearing today, and thank you for uh, to the, all of the witnesses for appearing and for sharing your stories, which paint a very vivid and frightening picture of the of the horrific abuse that that Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims, as well as Hong Kongers, are being subjected to in China. And I'd like to to associate myself with the remarks and opinions of many of my colleagues on this committee, um, in particular with regard to forced labor. And as one of the you know co-sponsors of the Uyghur Forced Labor uh, Prevention Act, uh, and the uh, and my own Uyghur Forced Labor Disclosure Act, I absolutely agree that we need to do more about this. I mean, it's it's really terrible the way that China is trying to launder their supply chains and sanitize them by through through other programs like the pairing assistance program and things like that, which which move the the uh, the forced labor outside of the Uyghur region. But it's a start to have these, you know, these these orders on the uh, cold release orders on the tomatoes and the and the cotton. But I do believe that the administration needs to do more, and hopefully, we in Congress will be able to come to an agreement and do more as well. With regard to the Olympics, I again agree with my colleagues that this is really a frightening development. Um, we all remember 2008 when everybody said, "No, it'll be fine. You know, this will help open China and make them more more democratic in their in their methodologies and what they do." Well, in fact, it had the opposite effect. I mean, it was a huge spectacle that everybody around the world really admired. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, China decided to double down on the human rights abuses and they escalated to genocide. I, I shudder to think what they will do after a successful hosting of the Olympics uh, in, in 2022. So I do think we need to keep the pressure on the IOC as well as the sponsors and NBC. So uh, Ms. Enos, you know, today we're talking about ways that we can help uh, help refugees and other, you know, of, of these folks who are being uh, who are being, uh, you know, systematically oppressed here in the U.S. through our through either legislation or administrative actions. Uh, and the State Department included Uyghurs and Hong Kongers in its proposed refugee admissions reports for FY 2022, and that's the first time that either population had been included. Can you explain exactly what constitutes priority access and does it does it does it include establishing priority to authorities? Yes, so my position is that uh, priority to would be the best option for both Uyghurs and Hong Kongers over the long term. Um, as I illuminated in my testimony, um, I really think that P2 and creating that special humanitarian, um, uh, you know, uh, group makes it so that they actually have preference within the system. While they still have to prove their individual case of persecution, um, it, it's what gets them in the door. Um, and I'm glad that you brought up that Uyghurs and Hong Kongers were mentioned um, in the refugee uh, determination. Um, but I think there's one other aspect that has been overlooked, which is uh, when the Trump administration um, issued their executive order, I think it's um, 13936, that changed um, Hong Kong's uh, special status. Um, they also had a provision within there that said refugees from Hong Kong should be able to come and find safe ha haven here in the U.S. And I think this provision has been underexplored. 
Um, and so this may actually present additional opportunities for letting Hong Kongers in, even outside of a P2 designation that I think uh, members of Congress should be asking the administration about. So this is something perhaps worth considering. But I think P2, um, it enables individuals to bypass referral from UNHCR NGOs um, or an embassy, um, and it enables them to have that special humanitarian status that puts them in line uh, in order to be resettled, and there's still vetting that's involved. So to me, this is the best long-term solution for what is a long-term problem facing both Uyghurs and Hong Kongers. Thank you very much. Now, my office here in Northern Virginia is helping many, many uh, families with visa applications, and this includes Uyghurs and Afghans. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is, is the backlogs at State Department. Uh, and understaffing at the various agencies. I don't see how we do this without more money uh, for visa processing and resettlement. And that's one of the issues that we're facing right now is that the State Department has basically been gutted and needs to rehire more people. Um, what other resources does the federal government need to ensure that people aren't languishing backlogged in the in immigration system? Ms. Enos, do you have an answer to that? Um, so in terms of overall backlog in the immigration system, that's outside my area of expertise. I, I focus mostly on Asia, but I do think that, um, you know, it would be a good idea to increase staffing. I think it would also be a good idea um, to return to the normal average level of refugee resettlement. Um, there is a historic average that is there, um, and we have fallen pretty far below that in recent years. Um, so I think it's, it's worth considering um, how we can get our system up to date in order to be responsive to the needs of today. And I think there can be no question that the situation facing Uyghurs is arguably one of the worst human rights atrocities likely that will happen in the 21st century. So we need to be mobilizing in the ways that we can to provide relief to those who we can. Thank you very much. I absolutely agree with you. And Mr. Isgill, um, I'm so sorry to hear what your family has been through as well as, you know, as well as the challenges and, and abuse and, and threats that, that Uyghurs uh, in other countries are facing right now. I will say that, you know, when, when Secretary Blinken appeared before my subcommittee, he did indicate that, that the State Department was in discussions with those countries trying to prevent, you know, trying, trying to help alleviate the pressure and, and, and bring U.S. resources and assistance to those other countries. Uh, but I know that it's very challenging for them. Um, can, you, can you explain or, or tell us a little bit more about what we can do to help asylum seekers like your family obtain the security you deserve? Other Wakta Shu Ang Muim Ish Mushu Azrache Sassi Panal Ultimase, Best Kahan, Yaki Albumoit Khan Uyur Laninke, Mushasi Panal Ultimase, Albul Shkirek, and the Bo Night Tahras British. I think it's quite urgent to solve the asylum uh, cases of the Uyghur people, been, which have been pending for a long time. Or backlog. Çünkü bu ultimas tasiklanmagan uygurla azır balların alim mektepte oktosh cehetlerde ve başka turmuş cehetlerde kıyınçlık uygulu batıdı. There are a lot of difficulties that the Uyghurs are facing at the moment, such as not being able to send their kids to the college. Şun hamde bu kanunun ki uygur işlik okukun kogdas kanunun ki tasiklanışı. Uh, it will bring uh, a lot of great things if uh, the government passes law about the Uyghur policy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. We Thank clearly you. have a lot of work still to do. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Thank Congresswoman. Uh, we're wrapping up uh, this hearing and a couple thoughts as we do so. First, I appreciate my colleagues raising the Olympics. Uh, it is uh, absolutely outrageous that the International Olympic Committee uh, failed to, to act on China's gross violations of human rights, including genocide, 
in terms of moving the Winter Olympics scheduled for February, just four months from now. The International Olympic Committee says that it secured promises from China in 2015 when it was assigned the Olympics. Obviously, the International Olympic Committee has not held China to its promises on human rights. The International Olympic Committee says its interest is only in the athletes, and therefore it does not take action on such egregious conduct by the host country. This is absolutely unacceptable. If that was the philosophy, then why did they secure promises in 2015? Furthermore, they are forcing athletes from around the world to help provide a shiny facade for China while China is engaged in genocide. This is not just some bureaucratic failure, this is a profound abuse of athletes from around the world, forcing them to be on the international stage in pursuit of their athletic accomplishments and in the process, helping China disguise its conduct. This can never happen again. And I must say, it has reverberations of 1936, when Germany hosted the Olympic Games and used it also to create a facade against its, to hide its already egregious actions against Jewish citizens and other citizens of Germany and then went on to even more egregious actions uh, afterwards. So we have to press forcefully to defend the right of every athlete to speak out at the Olympics, for sponsors to end their sponsorships, for diplomats not to attend, and of course, as my colleagues, I called also for these games to be moved. The Olympic Committee has said they will not do so. So we must utilize every other action we, we can in this situation. I also want to draw attention to China's coercion of governments to repatriate uh, those at risk, uh, Hong Kongers who are abroad or Uyghurs who are abroad. We must not let China coerce countries around the world to repatriate those at risk back to China for persecution. And finally, I want to again emphasize that with the Uyghur community, we are talking about enslavement of millions of individuals. We are talking about forced sterilization, forced birth control, forced labor, that is slavery. We're talking about the cultural extinguishment of connections and language. This is a situation that has been deemed genocide by both a Republican administration in the United States and a Democratic administration in the United States. The facts are incontrovertible. Holding these Olympics in China is a horrific, horrific uh, situation. And we need to do everything we can so journal for athletes never to be placed in this situation uh, again. It's a, an abuse of the thousands of athletes from around the world. I will close by thanking our three witnesses, Ms. Enos, Mr. Chung, Mr. Isgil, for again bringing your, your expertise and experiences to bear. This is incredibly important human rights work that's the way we respond here will affect the situations that millions of others are put into by other governments around the world as they watch how we re respond. The Uyghur Human Rights Project has submitted a statement for the record. I ask unanimous consent that the statement be entered into the record. Without objection, it will be entered. Ms. Zenos, you mentioned a report of the Heritage Foundation. Would you like to enter that into the record? Yes, please, the one on the Olympics and the one on forced labor, if possible. Thank you. Without objection, so done. The record will remain open until the close of business on Friday, October 22nd. For any additional articles or information that members would like to put into the record or for questions that they might have for our witnesses. This hearing 
is adjourned. <laughs>